Hello everybody, welcome to uh, our June meeting. I'm going to move so I'm not standing in front of the screen. Yeah, I'm still missing a couple of people, maybe they'll, they'll roll in, but I uh, figure if she gets started. Um, I just want to let everybody know, um, you do have to pay for your food and drinks. Um, although we haven't had a problem in a, in a while, so maybe we can take this off. <laughs> or maybe this is why. Yeah, so you do have to pay for your food. Um, we've got a Google Plus community that you can sign up for. If you search for Toronto Java User Group, you'll find us. And um, we record all of these meetings, so if you know anybody who should see this presentation or you know, you've missed a meeting or something like that, uh, check us out. We're on Vimeo or we link all the, the videos to our website too. So uh, Java news for this month is what I, what I found. Um, and a couple from Jeff who were posted them to the community. Java 7 update 25 came out, so everybody needs to update again. And um, list of things that were included with that, it actually checks certificates now. Like when, when you start up an applet or when you start up a Java web start, it actually goes and see if there's a CRL and checks that out, so that's pretty cool. Um, this is all mostly security related. They added a couple attributes to the manifest um, so you can seal into your, your jar whether or not it should be sandboxed or whether it has all access and where it's supposed to come from. So if somebody grabs your jar and moves it to another site, uh, you can keep it from working properly. Um, for anybody who actually uses Live Connect, which I don't think has been used for about 10 years, um, it doesn't work if you have Java security set to high on your browser. Um, there was um, a security problem in Javadoc output from previous versions of the Javadoc compiler where it, there was some sort of frame insertion exploit people could do. I don't know. I don't really, didn't really dig that deep, but they've updated that. And they've got a tool that updates your Javadoc if you made it with the old tool. I think it had something the Javadoc template had something in it where you could put a request parameter <laughs> on the URL and it would echo it back into the page source. There's something very strange, yeah. You know, it's a great um, they've added a help button for all their new security dialogues that say why your applet isn't running. Um, they've changed the command line parsing in runtime.exec, especially under Windows. So. Um, They've actually added a new method to set it for the old way if the new way breaks your code. So you may have to, if you use code that uses exec, then you may want to check it. And uh, they did a whole bunch of bug fixes, which don't really make the change log. You have to really dig for those, but fixed a few things. So that's update 25, pretty big one, and uh, worth installing. Um, this is our <laughs> monthly slide. We're doing really well. <laughs> We're up to six. Uh, a new high score. A new high score? <laughs> so, or, or maybe this guy is forgetting to update his site. I don't know. It maybe got hacked. It's good. New version of Eclipse coming out because of, it's the new year, the new Eclipse cycle, I guess. And um, they've decided that people use Git. Yep. It's very exciting. So you can, they just put eGit in with Eclipse, I think. eGit's actually really good. It's, like, it's as good as the CVS integration used to be. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. yeah. They've got um, Garrett integrated with Mylan, so you can do code reviews right from inside Eclipse, which is very cool. Just one click and... Is that one by default? Yep. Wow. A um, bunch of stuff with the JDT, null checking, um, things like that. Um, Platform improvements, they, you can break more windows out of the GUI and move stuff around. And they've just updated the UI a little bit. And they've also improved the plugin installer. So when it dies with a dependency error and there's a cryptic error message and you have no idea what to do, then there's a, a form that helps you now. So that's the new Eclipse. Is that out now? Or? It's beta-ish or just recently released, like the version yeah, 1. Yeah, the release was Wednesday. So it's, it's fresh. <laughs> oh, was it yesterday? Well, yesterday was Wednesday. Oh, 
yeah. That's the same thing. <laughs> Um, this was a bit of excitement that I heard from some of my sysadmin friends who work with Java. Um, Oracle decided that they would pull down their time zone update tool. They had a standalone tool that would go and fetch new time zone database and oh, yeah. put it into your Java install. And they pulled that down and said, nope, you need to buy support for that. And then uh, Heinrich said, wait, no, that doesn't give us free updates for Java 7 anymore. And we said we'd do that. So maybe we should put it back. So they put it back. Specifically, the tool that lets you update all the time zone details in JDK you already installed. Yeah, well, they were originally saying that the release cycle was now often enough. They didn't need to, right. you could just get the new Java and that would have the new time zones, but. Well, yeah. because of the zero day exploits, right? So. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know yeah, if they want to keep up with that. Days, it's one of those, so yeah. yeah, so that was exciting. They did realize they should keep it free. Yeah. Um, Oracle and Microsoft made an announcement that they're going to work together and make um, more Oracle stuff cloudy, and that includes Java. So they're going to support Java platform on Windows Azure kind of officially, and more products under Hyper-V. And if you, if you run a hardcore Windows server shop, then maybe you'll get more Java success. Uh, I brought back the conference calendar. So this is what's coming up. Uh, Java Zone in September. Uh, Java 1, September 22. Probably people here have talks in Java Java 1. Yeah? Look, look, look. <laughs> it's great. So you can go to go to San Francisco and see these guys talk. Um, usually... Yeah, CFP is still open, I think, for another three days. Yeah. Um, usually we get deals for these, so um, I don't think we have anything official for Java 1 yet, but... Um, when we do, we'll let you know. Often there's a discount for JUG members, so uh, we'll pass that along when we hear about it. And uh, yeah, some of these prices aren't official. DevOx and JFocus haven't released their pricing for this year, but that's last year's pricing and they never change it very much. So all of these conferences are really good. Um, I've been to Java 1 and DevOx and both were awesome and worth the trip and worth the time. So. Definitely pick one and go to one. It's a bit stories about what you do. Yeah. The conferences, because you get to go in for free, if you're speaking. Mm -hmm. and they're all starting for like real sort of like case study talks. But this is how I apply a bunch of technologies to my actual project. Yeah, so definitely. Submit a bit of paper. Tons of, tons of submissions about I made this framework. And not so many about I used this framework. So I'm definitely looking for those. <laughs> All right, and that's the news that I've got. Can I have one more news item? All right. This is something that is a new way you can download the JDK. They have a new package called the server JRP, mm. which is like the JDK without the Java plugin. This was their basically, uh, they're saying that uh, people are, you know, because of all the bad press we got on the, uh, on the browser plugin, we're going to make a server JRE that you can download, which doesn't have the browser plugin. So you won't be exposed to future exploits in that area. That's awesome. But the interesting thing about it is that it's all packaged as .gz files. So oh. you can now, like it makes it a lot easier to embed a private JRE that has like Java C in it and all of the monitoring tools, like uh, you know, Visual VM and other stuff without having to run through an RPM or a .exe to get it. And uh, they unfortunately don't have a version of it for Mac OS, but I submitted a bug report to them. They've accepted it. So. That's great. Are they going to make a public repo or anything so you can, you can download well, it? You or? Can, you can, like what I, you can do is take it, download it, throw it in your own Maven repo or somewhere. Right. Or wherever you can access it. But it's, it's really cool that now it just has the server GRE without... without well, that's a good idea. And this is as of uh, the update that just came up. As so of 25. Cool. Any other news? No? OK. We have a presentation on effective Android HTTP from uh, Jesse. So I'll hand it over to him, and we'll get started. So uh, I used to work on the core libraries team at Google on Android. And so I kind of have, uh, I've got a fun, interesting perspective on HTTP stuff just because I was working on the HTTP client on Android. Um, the, uh, the way that... Oh. <laughs> um, 
So this is a recycled presentation from a presentation I gave at NDevCon in Boston three weeks ago. And that presentation was crazy because they had me do two hours talking about Android and HTTP. And I like, felt like I had to stretch everything to talk about Android and HTTP for two full hours. That seemed like, uh, like I couldn't possibly come up with enough stuff. And so I have like 90 slides on Android and HTTP. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to like mostly rush through it. And I want you guys to slow me down if you see something interesting. Um, the other thing is, is that I was talking to an Android developer audience. And I think we're more of a sort of server audience. Is that accurate? Yeah, no? Who's, who's writing Android apps day to day? OK, then I feel like that's accurate. <laughs> um, so I'll, uh, I'll try to make that fit. Um, and uh, yeah, let's go. Um, so I'm going to talk about what HTTP looks like in 2013. Uh, it's not your father's HTTP, maybe? Um, talk about some HTTP clients for Android and then some essential development tools. And then I'll talk about three Android libraries, Retrofit, Picasso, and Volley. Um, and I'll probably talk a little bit more about the problems that these tools go into than the specific tools. Just because for this room, if we're not going to be using these tools, then I don't really need to talk about the uh, specifics of their APIs or anything. Um, and this is the funnest part of this talk. For NDevCon, I pr prepared a uh, GitHub project with just hello world examples for all these different libraries. And if you're doing uh, HTTP stuff, generally getting started is pretty easy, but having all the moving parts all talking to each other is really nice. So uh, there's a project there. Um, <coughs> so uh, I'm not going to do the demo. Um, has anybody done this before? Telnet to port 80? Yeah, so this is my favorite part of HTTP, or one of my many favorite parts of HTTP. Uh, you can just read it and write it. It's really trivial to sort of see how the, wh what's happening. And all the, tools, uh, all the tools can be relatively structurally simple when they're built on these simple parts. So when you use Chrome and you want to inspect, inspect what's happening in your web sessions, there's no real complexity happening behind the scenes. It's just giving you back the headers that it got from the server. And the protocol is really s pretty straightforward. Um, the things that aren't straightforward about HTTP is just how all the headers work, how they interact. So here I've got like an e-tag header and an accept ranges header. And these, these things get a little bit gnarly. But for the most part, um, it's a pretty simple system. Um, HTTP proxies, uh, they exist and annoy. Uh, is this consistent with everybody's experience? They just sort of exist to make life trouble. You speak HTTP to the proxy, it speaks HTTP to the world. And most HTTP proxies are HTTP and HTTPS. For the mostly Android audience, this was pretty interesting, just because when you're writing for a, an app, you don't necessarily know what the HTTP uh, proxy situation is going to be when you deploy. Um, the other thing that's like the most important part of HTTP is just that the protocol is designed around caching. Caching is like not something that was afterthought. Caching is pretty much what HTTP is. So uh, everywhere in the protocol, there are concerns around caching. And it made sense in the 90s when they were designing this, and our network uh, pipes were very narrow. And it makes sense again today because we're using our phones, and our network pipes are very narrow. So caching is always going to make HTTP run faster. And it's always going to make uh, life harder for us because we have to worry about things like cache and validation. Um, I will skip the caching example. In, in this example, I was talking about just sort of the conversation between a server and a client. And the most interesting part is that HTTP has this cool concept called conditional caching. So you make a request to the server. It gives you back a response. And it says, like, here's a hash or an ID or a version of this res response I gave you. That's an e-tag. And then later you can say, hey, server, uh, give me this URL. Or don't if the current version is this uh, ID that I currently have. So I already have version 5. Give me this URL. And the server can um, optionally say, here's the full response. It's called version 6. Or it can say, what you have is fine. And so you don't have to transmit the whole payload. 
So if you're writing applications, really, really go out of your way to try and make this work. It's really handy, and you can make things a lot faster. Um, I feel like caching is one of these things that probably would speed up a lot of the apps that we work on, but that we don't really turn on because it's like a day's work and you get no sort of product feature from it. But uh, the performance benefits are really good. Um, oh, and here's what I just said. Here's my advice. Use cache control and e-tag headers. Um, so cache control, max age is 3,600 seconds, e-tag v3. It's pretty much this simple. And the browser just does what's right. It will uh, make requests later. Uh, max age 3,600 means this is a, you don't have to do anything for the next hour. And then after that hour expires, the browser can still do validation because it doesn't expire its cache immediately. It'll keep this stale resource in its cache, you know, three weeks from now. And it'll say, I still got version five. And a lot of the times that will just work. Um, don't use modification dates. Uh, HTTP doesn't have a very good way of parsing dates. Isn't that hilarious? All right. Um, the other one that's important is if you're serving like a static resource, say you're Twitter and you're serving a profile picture of somebody, what the wrong thing to do is to say Jay Wilson's profile picture is twitter.com slash profile slash jaywilson.ping. And when I update my profile picture, that, gets, that, that URL gets a new file behind it. That's the absolute wrong way to do it. The right way to do it is to always create a brand new unique URL for every resource. And then in your web page or whatever, you point at the most recent resource. And so what that allows you to do is always say, our image is cache forever. You don't have to worry about cache invalidation. You don't have to worry about policies around, when I change my profile picture, are people seeing stale profile pictures? You can just say, always cache the images forever. And then you always give uh, identifiers or URLs for resources. Really handy. Um, that's probably the best advice I'll give you all night. Uh, this is hilarious. Uh, occasionally, you're bottlenecked by the speed of light. So if you're trying to make uh, your applications fast, and your web servers are in Toronto, and your cu customers are in London, then your ping times are just going to require trips across the ocean. Um, that's awesome. Uh, content delivery networks exist to work around some of this problem. When I was saying about images and giving each image a fixed resource, this really works well with CDNs because you can say, like, this is a fixed image that never ever changes. You can put it in a thousand web servers all across the world. They can cache them forever, and you never have to worry about invalidating them. Uh, <clears throat> and this, this technology is also extremely cool. Uh, there's a program called Thumbor, not a Java tool, it's a Python app. But you, uh, It'll take about a day to set up a Thumbbore server. And what it does is it'll take all of your image resources that you want, and it'll allow you to dynamically resize them on the fly, or crop them, or do all sorts of uh, simple image techniques. So the top image, that's the URL for this image of the square stand. The bottom image, thumbbore.squareup.com slash unsafe slash 160 by 160 slash, and then the other URL. What this does is it dynamically downloads the full size image from my web server to my other web server. It resizes it to 160 by 160, and then it ret returns the 160 by 160 bytes over the network. Really, really handy. Um, it doesn't take that much time to set up. When you configure it, you say, you know, I only resize resources for my websites. So for us, you know, it's only squareup.com things. But once you set it up, then you don't have to worry about. Um, your customers downloading images that are the wrong size. If you want to do you know, a social network and you have like your mobile view and your uh, web view and all these different things, everybody just gets the right sizes by default. Um, and you can, you can even have the devices configure the image resource sizes. So uh, iOS, every single device has exactly the same number of pixels on its width. Android, the, the layouts are much more elastic. And so you can say, like. Every single Android, this image is full width, regardless as to how many pixels, uh, regardless how many pixels wide the screen is. So that's really handy. Uh, do that. Use Thumbbar, and don't write your own because it's a security nightmare and it's hard to do. Um, it's hard to do well. Yeah, and it sets the cache headers for you. How cool is that? 
Um, HTTP has built-in gzip compression. So um, I've got a picture of one of our applications called Square Wallet. And when you run Square Wallet, it downloads a directory with like a list of nearby stores. And you know, there are special Starbucks is a peppermint mocha, some geo data, you know, a bunch of data. It's just a big data file. And so we have this directory file. It's 53 kilobytes of JSON. And if we were to take this exact same file and represent it in protocol buffers, which is like you know, the, the Lord standard for efficient enco uh, compact encoding, it goes from 53 kilobytes to 31. But if we gzip each of those, the result is pretty much a wash. gzip JSON is 9 kilobytes for this particular resource and 8.5 for Proto. So the reason the compression is so much, uh, eliminates so much of the difference is that with almost all of our resources, they're almost entirely strings. There's things like you know, place names and uh, URLs to resources and uh, descriptions and things, and XML is just full of strings. And those strings don't actually encode very well in Proto because they don't have anywhere to go. Um, so you don't save that much with protocol buffers. But with gzipping, everything just gets vacuumed out. So HTTP has built-in gzip. Um, if you're writing mobile apps, make sure it's enabled. If you're serving data to mobile apps, make sure it's enabled. Um, and then the only other advice for that is uh, when your clients are doing this, if you're writing for browsers, they do this automatically. Make sure your clients accept gzip encoding. And make sure that on your server, <coughs> you don't bother gzipping already compressed content. So you're not going to get any additional compression if you compress a ping file. It's already been compressed. Um, yeah. DNS, this is kind of a lie. This is an HTTP. Uh, HTTP clients have to deal with DNS. Um, one thing that makes uh, HTTP hard is that you ask for a resource by its host name, and then the HTTP client resolves it with a uh, IP address. And uh, because we have our data centers, you know, the one on the East Coast and the one on the West Coast, or the one on the West Coast, and then the redundant <laughs> failover one on the West Coast in case of a uh, uh, you know, major outage, then your HTTP client needs to be able to uh, attempt DNA, uh, your IP address alternates if the first ones fail. So that's the thing. Um, if you support IPv4 and IPv6 simultaneously, then you obviously have two IP addresses, one for each. And so your HTTP client needs to try each. And it'll do weird things like it'll, it'll say, you know, I'm IPv4, so I'll try the IPv4 address. Uh, and if it's IPv6, it may still try the IPv4 address first. Uh, the internet is weird. Um, cool. Wi-Fi hotspots. This is a, just a classic Android-only problem where you're writing your mobile app. Your mobile app says, I want to download this picture. And instead of getting the bytes of some resource, it gets the uh, splash screen for signing on to McDonald's Wi-Fi. So this sucks. Uh, this is a real pain for every application developer because they have to worry about this. Um, the uh, McDonald's Wi-Fi screen doesn't realize that it's not talking to Chrome. It's like, oh, you know, you've asked for uh, profilepic.ping. Uh, I'll give you some HTML. So this is just like the web sucks, um, and it's excellent. But uh, you have to defend against this thing if you're writing applications these days. Uh, now we're getting fun. HTTPS. HTTPS is the cat's pajamas. Um, reduces eavesdropping when you use the Wi-Fi at Panera Bread or at the airport. Um, HTTPS is fantastic. Uh, part of HTTPS is certificate authorities. There's lots and lots of problems with the certificate authorities. Remarkably, I wrote this before the uh, most recent governments want to spy debacle. Um, so I, I, I consider myself you know, one for one on bullets. Um, Governments really do want to spy. Uh, the US is not the only government that wanted to spy. When I was writing this, I was thinking about the Middle Eastern governments. And what they want to do is they want to say, if you're making a web request within their country to Google.com, they'll return a Google.com certificate that wasn't signed by Google. It was like it's signed by some rogue certificate authority. So um, 
basically, certificate authorities are terrible. They're this like relic from the 90s when we set up the you know, SSL infrastructure in the beginning. And it's just still around, and it's still disgusting. Um, if you're a browser vendor, like if you're Mozilla and you make Firefox, you have this hard problem. Um, people will email Mozilla and they'll say, hi, I'm in, um, I'm in Pakistan and I'm trying to load this website and it's not working and uh, I don't understand. And it works in you know, Internet Explorer. And then Mozilla has to say, oh, it looks like there's a certificate authority in your country and it's included in Internet Explorer by default. So Internet Explorer implicitly trusts this certificate authority and so therefore, everybody who uses Internet Explorer implicitly trusts this secure certificate authority. And what happens is, is that then Mozilla has to be like, well, we can break the web for these people, or we can support the certificate authority as well, and we also implicitly trust them. And so it's this weird ratcheting effect where certificate authorities sort of like, once they get the trust of one browser, it tends to domino over and they all get trusted. And so as you, when you use the web, and you get the little lock icon in your browser. You're trusting all of these companies that are not at all worthy of your trust. All of these certificate authorities, you know, they're all probably given, um, they're all probably haven't been handed notices from the NSA that says, you know, let us impersonate your clients and we're gonna put you in a, we're gonna put you in a dark hole if you don't, and, or if you tell anybody. So certificate authorities are bad. Um, there's a workaround. Uh, yes, browser vendors have two bad options. Include a CA, don't include a CA, right? Uh, you include it, and now you're trusting this rogue company on behalf of your users. You don't include it, and now your users can't visit legitimate websites. Um, so what I recommend for Android developers is hard code your certificate in your application. So you take your certificate from your server that uh, only you have the private uh, keys for. You give the public keys to your application, and then even if uh, the NSA or some other rogue government entity wants to spy on your, you, on your traffic, they can't, because uh, your, your application won't trust just any signed certificate. It'll only sign the one that you package with your application. The, uh, the catch is, is that you still have to get your application on your user's devices. So if you were a particularly devious, sneaky company, you just impersonate like the Google Play Store or the, uh, the App Store. Hostname verification. This is invisible. When, when you go to um, any website that has a certificate attached to it, the certificate has a list of websites that it says, uh, I'm allowed to you know, encrypt traffic for squareup.com. And unfortunately, the uh, implementations of the code that matches whether the list of, of sites that a certificate says it can trust and the actual rules, um, they're really ambiguous and bad. And there's this great article recently, the most dangerous code in the world, validating SSL certificates in non-browser software. So this is where you download like the uh, TD Bank app and the TD Bank app, you run it, and it makes an SSL connection to the bank's website. And the crypto all happens. But then what one thing needs to happen is it gets a certificate, and it says, is this certificate good for api.tdcanadatrust.com? And the site's like, eh, you know, it, it, it generally is like, sure, I'll return true. And it shouldn't. Or it'll, it'll say, like, uh, you know, extra domains, or you'll have rogue servers. So you have to be really, really careful about this. Um, if you're writing any applications that do SSL, please don't write your own SSL cert validation code because you'll get it wrong, and then you'll get the lock icon, and crypto will be happening. And for the most part, when it's your regular users, everything works. But you've just sort of opened a wide security hole in your application. Am I going too slow? Am I going too fast? This is fun. Sort of rapid fire. Cool. Uh, cookies. Cookies, uh, as, as spe this is from like me, poor me implementing HTTP clients. Cookies are really annoying as implementer of HTTP clients because there's four specifications. Uh, the Netscape one, which isn't on the web because this company called uh, America Online bought Netscape and then like 
tore down all their documentation. <laughs> right? You've got like this Netscape, like this is how cookies work, documentation, and then they get bought and that document leaves the internet for some reason. Uh, RFC 2109, then RFC 2965, and then RFC 6265, a uh, quote from the last one is, prior to this document, there were at least three descriptions of cookies. However, none of these documents describe how cookie and set cookie actually are used on the internet. So this is like a state of how things are specified. Um, it's a sort of a warning to anybody who would, would design a spec. Uh, it really doesn't matter what your spec says. As soon as you've got like clients and servers out there on the internet, they'll just figure out what each other's bugs are and they'll work around them. I learned this uh, implementing web sockets. Yes. The RFCs were lies. The <laughs> RFCs until I started testing. The RFCs are always aspirational. They're like, it should do this. <laughs> and it should like, you know, it, it should warn the user about this if something bad happens, but you can't. Because the people who implemented it, the client and the service side got bored after they read the first half of the RFCs. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Or, or the first, you know, first two of these RFCs. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, ranges. Uh, restarting a failed download sucks. If your app does large downloads, you need to do ranges. So this is just saying uh, if you're downloading MP3s or something, and you download half of them and you lose connectivity, you can actually resume that download if your server supports it and if your application goes through the effort of doing it. Uh, I use a podcasting app and it makes me extremely frustrated when I attempt to download and I get you know three quarters of the way through and then uh, because I'm on a mobile network you know I drop signal for a few minutes and I have to start the download from scratch again so I encourage range headers all right and this is where it gets really fun sockets a single user client should not maintain more than two connections with any server or proxy that's a uh, quote from the HTTP specification. So it says, if you're like implementing a browser and you need to get the web page uh, hotwired.com, you know, you got the banner image, you got to download that, and the HTML, don't make two connections, don't make more than two connections simultaneously. Uh, today, IE10 uses eight, and Chrome and Firefox each make six simultaneous connections to every server that you use. So um, sockets are this like fantastic, you know, TCP IP, we love TCP IP. Uh, it is what makes the internet. Uh, but HTTP and sockets have this like dysfunctional relationship where HTTP wants uh, sockets to work one way and sockets in practice work a different way. Um, so one example is that there are just hacks upon hacks for the way that HTTP and the web have evolved to work around sockets problems. Um, have you guys seen this where you look at some image on some web page and instead of it being like the single check mark image, it's like a ping with like 11 different things and they're all sprited in place and the browser has to crop them to the right positions? You guys familiar with that, seeing that? That's, that's disgusting and it's just like us working against ourselves because of the, uh, the cost of creating sockets. So if every single time you want to download an image and you have to download a Canadian flag, and a grayed out Canadian flag and all these other things, then um, you end up creating a lot of sockets. Every socket has a price in terms of latency on your web loading or your app loading. Um, and so there's all these sort of hacks to make these things work, uh, to work around the cost of sockets. And uh, this cute diagram shows how uh, sockets have a, a slow start. So if you want to connect to a website and it's got tons of images. Um, if you use a single socket and you download all of those images in, in serial, you're going to get the best throughput on your connection. You're going to use it most efficiently because of something called TCP slow start, where the first couple packets you send back and forth are sent slowly and then it starts to send them faster and faster until it starts dropping them. Um, there we go. So it'll go start and start faster, 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 it drops packet and then it starts and slows down how fast it sends packets again. But the most important part of this diagram is, is it always starts really, really slowly. So you're downloading resources, they start slowly, and then they get faster. Um, so the most efficient way to use a network connection is to use a single network connection and uh, put everything through that socket so that you always play in sort of the higher, uh, the higher throughput zone. But unfortunately, you also have to wait to get up that curve 
So this is why your browser has like six sockets or eight sockets, so that you can start showing images uh, rather than doing them all serially. Anyway, it's, it's all confusing and sucks. Um, and the workaround in every HTTP client is connection pooling. So when you download uh, five images on one, one page, it'll open one socket, download the first image. Once that image completes, then it'll reuse that socket to make a second request. And this works really well as long as every single resource downloads to completion. But if you're serving dynamic content, like you're serving a web page, and you're dynamically generating this page, and halfway through dynamically generating this page, your code throws an exception, then what's going to happen is that entire socket has to be torn down and regenerated so that it can, um, it's going to basically drop that socket and start back off in the slow part of the curve. Um, so connection pooling is a necessary hack. Um, and Speedy is the solution to this problem. Anybody heard of Speedy? Speedy is, uh, take all the good parts of HTTP, which is pretty much everything up until the point I got to say talking about sockets. And uh, keep the sockets, compress more stuff. And uh, lots and lots of people have had this idea. This is not an original idea. But the reason we're talking about Speedy and not one of the dozen other pr proposals is that Speedy has been the first attempted solution to this problem that solves the go-to-market problem, which is like, you know, we are talking about cookies before. How do I fix this cookies problem if we've got browsers and servers out there that are behaving with the wrong rules? Um, Speedy got traction in the market because Google turned on Speedy for its browser and it turned on Speedy for its servers. So uh, whenever you do anything on Google's websites in Chrome, they're using a much faster protocol. And, uh, and, and now they sort of made that technology available to everybody. Um, so Speedy's really cool. Uh, the last one, uh, Chrome browser plus Google website plus NPN. NPN is, is also kind of secret sauce. NPN is called Next Protocol Negotiation. And it's how uh, Chrome and Google's web servers figure out what, that they're going to use Speedy instead of HTTP as the way they send resources back and forth. Um, and for NPN to work, you need SSL. Because what NPN does is it, it plays as a part of the uh, SSL handshake. And so server says, like, you know, give me your certificate, uh, give me your website. And then it also says, oh, by the way, I'd like to speak speedy if you support it. OK, cool. Android's HTTP clients. Uh, this is what uh, HTTP client does. Creates a request, does HTTP, handles the response. So the application is the oval, and the HTTP client is the box. And then I just want to show how things get really complicated all the time. This is, again, me as the HTTP client implementer trying to evoke sympathy from the audience. So with redirects, now we have more flow. And we have to send the request creation back. Um, and then with routing, and what I mean by routing is like handling this multiple IP addresses types of scenarios, um, then you need to be able to say, like, oh, I tried your first data center's IP address. And that failed, I'll try your second data center's address. And then uh, with caching, then things get sort of more hairy. And you have to figure out, do I cache things from like which data center do they belong to? There's all these sort of like interacting features. Um, so that's what the client's responsibility is. It's sort of to negotiate that maze of a flowchart. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is called HTTP URL connection. And I got this diagram of this like very traditional bicycle to describe HTTP URL connection. Um, limited API grown organically since 1996, and it's about 9,000 lines of code in Android. Uh, 1996, that's like when, like what was the web browser in 1996? Does anybody remember what browser they're using then? Netscape. Netscape 1? I think I was probably using it Yeah. So, oh, yeah. so like when HTTP URL connection came onto the scene, all of these HTTP features I've been talking about, they like hadn't come out yet. We were still in that Netscape cookie spec idea. And so this thing is a dinosaur, and it was sort of built in a dinosaur uh, era. Um, and uh, it's got its issues. Um, on uh, The connection pool configuration is gross, so you can't tell it 
in Android's APIs, there's no way to tell it how many sockets you want to use, for example. And uh, the connection pool is buggy in early versions of Android. My favorite part is that you say your preferences through sockets. Yes. Because yes. Awesome. So, question, uh, so this. Uh, so does the Chrome that runs on Android use the same APIs, or does it do something completely different? Chrome on Android currently uses the Chrome networking stack. Ah, okay. So they take their C code. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to demo HTTP. Oh, I'll demo. I think I can do it. Um, this is from the um, uh, no. OK, maybe not. Uh, did we get that? Cool. So, uh, get. So this is what this is what HTTP or all connection looks like. Uh, have you guys? Has everybody seen this before? This is not new to anybody, is it? Who hasn't seen this before? Cool. So. Uh, the thing that's really weird about this class is that you start with a URL and then you call open connection on a URL. This is like really weird. It's like if, uh, if you had a phone number class and it, you could like call through the phone number class. Uh, you're using data to like bring about heavyweight things and like you said, everything you have to do is static as a consequence of this because you can't say, hey URL open connection and you don't tell the URL what your socket policy wants to be, or something like that. Um, the heritage of that is interesting. It comes from the Java-based browser. Um, yes, yes. Called, uh, links, not links, Hot Java. Hot Java, yeah. <laughs> they just basically imported stuff from their app into the Java standard API before they realized it was a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So um, <coughs> do I have a port? Cool. All right. So, if I'm lucky, and I run my file server, and I'm in eight, nine, ten. Cool. That's not what I wanted. That's okay. Cool. Um, all right, back to the show. Uh, look at that awesome looking bike. So this is uh, like a really fancy primitive motorcycle. It looks like it was a lot of fun to build. Um, and that's uh, my picture for Apache HTTP client. Uh, I assume we're all using this in our server apps, yes? Is anybody writing server apps that do HTTP? Is anybody writing server apps that use HTTP without using this as the client? Yeah, so this is, this is really popular. Um, it's mature and capable. It's got lots of knobs and configuration, and uh, it's about 50k lines of code. So it's a kind of a beast. If you run into a problem and you want to diagnose what's going on, there's a lot of uh, enterprise in there to, to a step through. Um, where, where does the work I want to have happen? How do I get the behavior I want? The API is really wide open. Um, one one a typical example of this thing is I showed you those four cookie specs. This thing lets you pick which of those specs you want to follow. <laughs> right? Which, I mean, if you're implementing the spec to the word, that's interesting, but it's not anything anybody wants. Uh, I won't, I'll give him on that. So, um, here's what uh, the Apache client looks like. This, this definitely gets the first part right, which is that you have a client object that you can interact with. So you create your HTTP client. Default HTTP client gives you nice reasonable defaults. Uh, and then you can execute requests and print the responses. Um, and, oh, this is the vendor pitch part with my uh, square shirt on. The uh, sexy, fast, cool-looking bike is called 
OKHTTP, OK and this is something I've been working on lately. Um, it's a fork of Android's HTTP URL connection, so I took that old uh, classic traditional bicycle, and I've just been hacking on it and giving it features and making it do things that uh, 1996 never expected. So uh, speedy support and really aggressive fault recovery. So if you attempt to make, like I said, this connection across data centers, it attempts to do the right thing. And it's 12,000 lines of code. So that's a quarter of what the Apache client is. And I really personally value that a lot. It means that uh, if something goes wrong, you just step through it and there's not that much indirection or whatever. It's just HTTP. Uh, it does have its issues. It's brand new. There's no deep archive of support on Stack Overflow. You know, when, uh, when I'm using Apache, I can just say, like, you know, I'm getting this exception, paste it into Google. Google tells me, you know, first hit is Stack Overflow, and that's the answer, and I don't even have to think. Whereas with this thing, I, uh, I search for it, and I realize, oh, it's the HTTP client I'm working on. Of course, nobody's <laughs> figured out the problem that I just invented. So, uh, and, and the other thing that's weird about this is it still uses the uh, URL connection API, but it doesn't use static configuration for anything. Um, so I'll show you what that looks like. So this is a little bit of a hybrid of those two examples. Um, so create the HTTP client. Uh, it's not default, there's just one. And then you can open a URL and act, interact with it. Uh, but you're not, you're not dereferencing the URL, you're calling open on it. That's fun. And I'll show you, oh, that's fine. Okay. Cool. So this is the part of the talk I'm really most excited about. And I think I'll stop after this part, because I've been going on for a long time. This is like this two-hour talk that I'm compressing. Uh, two things. Uh, there's a program called Charles. It's a web debugging proxy, and it's 50 bucks. So you have to do some paperwork to get your boss to expense it. Or if you're your own boss, you have to like skip lunch or something. Um, so I, I adore this tool. Uh, and I don't have a Wi-Fi, so I don't know if I'll be able to think that useful. Um, that's fine. Um, so if I, I'm running Charles, oops, and it's got this like little recording button, and it's recording everything I'm doing on the internet. And then if I do, say, Firefox. Is that a Mac-only app, or? No, it's written in Java, actually. It's crazy, right? Like, I think it's super crazy that there's this, like, reasonable-looking uh, Mac application. And uh, if you run it, actually, you guys will totally get a kick out of this. Uh, you guys will totally get a kick out of this. Look and feel. Metal. Metal. Oh yeah, yeah, that's impressive, right? Can, can non-Java apps do this? No. Okay, so the, the important part I was trying to show is, is that previously I used Chrome to look up this, uh, this web page I'm running on my local desktop. Uh, and it's just some random JSON. Uh, and if I make the same request here, I think, uh, I'm not running that service anymore. I am still running that service. Okay, I suck. Eight, nine, ten. Um, so what's cool about this guy is that it recorded the request. It's a transparent HTTP proxy. So it sits between Chrome and my web server. In this case, both of them are running on my desktop. But in practice, it can be Chrome and Google.com, or it can be Chrome and um, it can be my Android device in my pocket talking to my computer via um, the same wi Wi-Fi network, and then my computer is talking to the internet. Um, but what it does is it lets me see everything that's happening. So I can see the, the request. Here's my HTTP requests. Here's the responses. Um, Mozilla is probing the internet for a resource while I work. So I can see everything that's going on. Um, 
Uh, and it also this this is cool. It shows you like a breakdown of where time was spent. So if you turn on Chrome and you request a web page, it'll give you a breakdown of like the times it was spending on every single resource. Um, and the other cool feature, two other cool features that I'll give you. Um, you can tell it to throttle your network. So you can say, like, what do my customers actually experience this as? Um, which is nice. 3G is actually like, a pretty good choice to have handy. You can you say. Know, you know, funnily enough, OS X has that feature built in. You can actually read them in your, uh, cool. any of your uh, interfaces. For real. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, so Charles or OS X, throttle your interfaces. The other cool feature is that this thing will do that thing I was telling you about earlier with certificate authorities. It will um, impersonate a certificate authority and let you eavesdrop on SSL traffic. And so the way this works is Charles has a SSL uh, sort of certificate signing mechanism inside of it. And it'll give you a certificate that you can install in your browser. And then, and that takes you know a minute, uh, help uh, install SSL certificate, add, there it is. Um, and then once you do that, then Charles can eavesdrop on all of your SSL traffic. Really, really handy for debugging. So when something goes wrong, you can see exactly why. So what it's doing is it's going to make an SSL request to the real server, take the response, and then serve it back to your, cu to your browser with a different certificate. It's a nice man-in-the-middle tool. Um, if you're doing anything with HTTP, I highly recommend you get this or something like it. Um, so is it it's a proxy server. server. So you just proxy. And I'll show you how that works too. The configuration is pretty slick. It's, it's, a, tra it's a transparent proxy. Transparent it's not a transparent proxy. It's not the client proxy. Yeah, so there's a checkbox here that says Mac OS X proxy. Uh, and this just turns it on for everything okay. using the operating system's system wide proxy setting. And Firefox doesn't use that setting, so there's a special checkbox to enable it in Firefox. The thing I tend to do is I tell my, um, my phone, I manually configure my phone to use a proxy server in the Wi-Fi settings. And I set it to be my computer with uh, Charles's, IP uh, Charles's IP address support. And so um, that allows me to eavesdrop all the traffic that's happening to my computer. Recently, I had a problem where I didn't know what the Gmail app was doing. I work on an app that uses a lot of email, and I wanted to spoof. I wanted to uh, investigate something that was going wrong in Gmail for Android. So I used Charles to record all of the HTTP traffic that was happening between my phone's Gmail app and Google servers. And Charles was able to do it, no problem. I could see all the requests and responses and things. So really great for reverse engineering. Did you need a fake uh, certificate for that as well? Yeah, so I installed the certificate on my phone. Got it. Yeah, and, and so the Gmail app. doesn't doesn't have the certificate. Gmail doesn't have that certificate hard coded in the app. It was just pretty funny, right? Yeah. So, so that means your employer can see all the email on your phone while you're. If your if your if your employer gives you your phone and it's got any certificate authorities you don't trust, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so in our Android applications, we actually have a checkbox that I added called HTTP proxy. And so you you check this box and it lets you pick. I just type in my IP address. And once I do that, then this all works. Uh, the other thing that's nice, so one last thing on this, the other thing that's nice is that um, when I need to talk to my servers that are on VPN from my phone that's not on VPN, but my <coughs> Mac is on VPN, Charles is, all my HTTP traffic flowing through Charles is actually flowing through the company VPN. So I can test that our behind the network servers are all working even though my phone isn't on VPN itself. All right. The last tool I'm going to talk about today is called Mock Web Server. This is something I've been working on. Um, and this is, uh, does my HTTP code work? Uh, so does anybody use these frameworks? Cool. So the way these frameworks all work is it's a script. You, tell some, you have some scenario. You basically pick everybody to be an actor. And you say, like, database manager, when this happens, this is your line. And uh, you know, web requester, when this method is called, this is your line. This is how you respond. And so. Um, Mocks are fantastic. They're really handy to test co very contrived situations that would be otherwise extremely awkward to set up. Um, and Mock Web Server is s of the same spirit as this, 
but it isn't actually a mock in it in the true sense of the word. Um, so, uh, so I have this class called HTTP login service, and uh, in this case, it's this like big heavyweight class, and we say login. It makes a request to a server, says post, do HTTP return response, um, and this do HTTP method, you know, it's actually making HTTP requests. So my my login service test wants to test that when I say, hey server, I want to log in. You know, I call my, the interface is login, username, password. I want to say, uh, test successful login. So the way mock web server works is you script HTTP responses, then you execute those, the corresponding requests, and then you can ver verify that the requests that you expected to be made were made. So in this case, I say, in QA response, uh, here's a random number. I don't know if you guys can see this. OK, so the way that my login service works is if you succeed at login, it'll return you a login token. So you say, uh, HTTP login service, login, and then I assert that the token it returned me was the one that the web server returned. Um, and then I can verify that the request that was made is the one I expected it to be. Does that all make sense? So you set up your response, you execute HTTP, and then you verify that the request that it recorded is the one you expected it to record. Uh, and so in this case, I've got two tasks, one that says test that my HTTP login service logs in successfully. Another one that says test that it logs in unsuccessfully. So in this case, the request, the response I enqueue is a 401. I don't want to make sure that when I call login on my login service, it throws an exception. So we'll see what that happens. So this is really nice. It's lightweight. It's like a 800 line Java class. Uh, and that's all there is to it. So if you're testing anything that's like making sure that two servers interact with each other, if you're doing like a uh, service-oriented architecture thing, and you want to say, this thing is supposed to make HTTP request to that thing, and that thing is going to fail in some interesting way, then instead of having to figure out how to make that thing fail in that interesting way, you can just make mock web server uh, play back those interesting responses. So I think that's all I'm going to talk about today. Um, there's a bunch of HTTP libraries for Android I'm not going to go into. And that's it. Uh, my advice, HTTP has knobs, lots and lots of knobs, uh, caching, cookies, these sorts of things. Use them. Um, don't forget about the server. Uh, and uh, don't fly blind. There's some really fantastic tools that make HTTP development really easy. Uh, that's it. <laughs> cool, I'm done. Questions? No questions, anybody? I'm around. We'll drink. <laughs> cool. Thanks.